This is a red balloon. It's true, it's red, we all know our colors. The absolute truth is that this balloon is red. No, it's not, that's green. What? This right here is a green balloon. That is the prettiest yellow balloon. <laughs> yellow? Th this is red. Yeah, come over here. No, it's green. It's red! Yeah, I know, it's a red balloon. <laughs> hey, will you look at it from my point of view, please? What? Hey, nice blue balloon. Blue. It's green! Green? It's red. What? Why are you saying it's red when it's blue, huh? It's what? totally purple from here! Purple? Okay, you know what? Let's just settle this once and for all, okay? Where are you going? Hey, what color is this balloon? I only see in black and white. Okay. Hey, Mark, what color? There is no balloon. This is ridiculous. Hey, I know what the problem is. Look, uh, my mom taught me that this was blue. But, um, you know, then she said this is red and green, yellow, you know, and on and on. <laughs> okay, I right. get that your mom taught you that that was blue, but I mean, that's not the truth. Whoa, why are you talking bad about his mom? Yeah. I'm not. Listen, I respect your mother. Thank you. And the way she raised you. She taught you that it was blue. Our moms taught us that it was red. Right. That's the way it goes. I thought you oh. said it was green. It is green. See, I'm smart. I went to college. <laughs> and in college, I learned all these different <laughs> theories about color. Really? And my color professors who have doctorates in color, do you have a doctorate in color? Uh, no. It shows, Ooh. okay? <laughs> they can't even agree on one theory of color, so you have to look at all the different theories and pick which one works best for you. And green is great for me. That makes sense. Thank you. No, you can't just pick whatever color fits your life the best. Red is red. Okay, do you know the word intolerant? Yeah. Because that's what you're being right now. <laughs> all right, you're shoving your opinion down my throat. Okay, it's not my opinion, it's the truth. <laughs> hold on, hold on. All we're saying is that we need to stop arguing about trivial things like truth. You know, the funny thing about truth is, it's true, whether you believe it or not. Pretty good video, right? Yeah. yeah. So you know what we're gonna talk about tonight? Truth. truth. Not red balloons. Color. Yeah, appreciate it. The color red, yep. So, Grab your Bibles, or turn on your Bibles, and uh, go over to Luke chapter 8. Luke 8. So how are we feeling about God tonight? Good. Feeling pretty good about God? Yeah. That's good. Is he who we desire to be with? Amen. Like, do we really desire to be with God? I know that we know that we're supposed to go, Amen. Yes, of course we want to be with God. Almost like afraid not to say that, right? Mm -hmm. Like we know it's the right thing to say. But do we really want to be in an eternal relationship with God? Yeah. yeah. Are we in love with God? Yeah. Are we in love with God? Do we love him? Hmm. So a lot of times I think if I can just give a good enough message or if I can say the right things, then I can help all of us to love God and to show up next week. Yep, it's all up to me. That, uh, that all of us will fall madly in love with God. And so I do my best to kind of construct this perfect message that will both challenge and encourage and inspire so that I can fill you with hope and a desire to have a relationship with God. I do. And that's what I try to do. I try to convince people to close the back door, to take away the safety net, and to trust God. And that's what I try to do. So if I do a good enough job, you'll come back next week, you'll give your contribution, you'll be a healthy Christian, you know, and all the things that come along with that. You'll invite people to church, you'll, you'll go and share all of what you've learned with other people and try to help other people to understand what you've found. But Jesus, he didn't preach that way. I've been mean, looking into this Jesus preaching to the crowd thing. And I'm like, Jesus never really tried to construct a message that made sense. Like a lot of times you're going, why would he say that? Like you, ever, you ever read through what Jesus was saying and you're going, he just left that whole crowd hanging. Like, 
what is he talking about? He didn't preach that way. So I'm, I'm, a lot of times I'm thinking, he's crazy. I do the exact opposite of what Jesus does a lot of times. I'm thinking of how to keep you, and Jesus is trying to figure out how to get rid of you. So it's kind of like, you know, we're going to look in Luke chapter 8. He's going from town to town, right? And, and maybe he's going to be coming to our church. And I think, Jesus, hey, can you be a guest speaker at the Southwest Florida Church of Christ? And Jesus is like, I'm coming to your town. And I'm like, you've got to stop by our church. And you've got to, you've got to do this amazing lesson. So what do we do? We get invitations, right? Why? Because Jesus is coming. So we get the invites, and you're, we're inviting people out. Jesus himself is going to be coming. He's going to inspire. He's going to do an amazing job. You've got to come out and witness Jesus, right? His message. What is he going to preach on? So I go to introduce him, and I kind of go, he's come all the way from Nazareth, right? He heals the sick. He heals the blind. He heals the deaf. He even touches lepers. And some say he walks on water. Yeah. He stands up to bullies. Come on. He protects the weak. He hangs out with the poor. This guy's awesome. He's loving. He's caring. He's spiritual. And he's been traveling from town to town. And he's here today. And you got to buckle your seatbelts because he's going to have a message that's going to blow you away. Without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Jesus. Woo! Come on! Luke 8, verse 5, Jesus comes on stage, and he walks up, and he says, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on. And the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground. And when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell along the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plant. Still, other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Peace out. And he walks off stage. And I'm like, where's the be a friend of Jesus? Like, where's the let me show you a miracle? Let me do these dazzling, amazing things. Where's the come on, help me out, Jesus? You gotta like get them back next week. But he's all done. He's elbows and heels. He walks off the stage. And he's basically like, if you get it, great. If not, you're not gonna get it. Really? So his disciples come to him and say, what is this all about? Why the parables, Jesus? Like, why not just tell people straight up what's going on? Because we don't even know what this means. And then in verse 10, He said, well, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to others, I speak in parables. See, I think a lot of times we think parables were meant to clarify. Jesus actually, a lot of times, he didn't use parables to clarify. He definitely wanted to relate. He wanted you to think. But a lot of times he did it to confuse. Look what he says here. But to others, I speak in parables so that though seeing, they may not see. Though hearing, they may not understand. That's why I speak in parables. Now, that is almost even hard to understand, right? Like you see, but you're not going to be able to see. You hear, you're not going to be able to hear. If you get it, great. If not, you're not going to get it. So Jesus, you don't want them to understand. Hmm. Like you don't want them to get it. You actually want them to walk away confused. Why? He does this all the time, by the way. So 
See, those who are really coming after him, only they will get it. That's why he's saying to you, you guys, you guys gave everything up for this. This is going to make sense to you. But those who aren't really coming after me, they're not going to get it. And I'm not going to chase after them. Jesus was only after those who really wanted it, and the rest can go home. So he kind of like, I'll give them a story about dirt, right? They won't get it. They don't really care to get it. And they'll just walk away. If they really want to know, they'll come after me. They'll persevere, and they'll find me. So when he explains it to the disciples, he gets a little deeper. He says, okay, look. And I'll kind of summarize this. The seed is the word of God, right? And then he says, well, first the path is what the seed falls on. And that's hard, right? The path is hard. So it's kind of like a street. And why would a farmer water a street? Hmm, okay. Next, it falls on the rocky ground. All the hype, no root, right? Not really in it for the right reasons. Why would I water rocks? Next, the thorns. Can't choose between the world and me. Can't give up the stuff that is in the world that has been ruling their life. They're not ready to walk away from it. Why would I water thorns? Like a good farmer wouldn't water a street. He wouldn't water rocks. He wouldn't water thorns, right? But those who have cleared their lives and desire the truth, they're who Jesus is there for. So he's going to water the good soil. So that is what Jesus is saying to the crowd. I'm not going to waste my time if you're not serious about this, if you don't want the truth. If you don't really want to hear what I have to say, then I'm not here for you. But those who are in it to win it, that's who I'm here for. So personally, I don't do that. Like, I'm not like Jesus in that department, probably in a lot of departments. I'm like, where's the verses about being a friend of Jesus, no teaching on grace and assurance and God's love? Where's the statements that would keep people wanting more? Basically, Jesus chases them off. And I think I'd be like, bro, there were large crowds, like large crowds. And Matthew had talked about they're so large that you had to get in a boat. And you just chase them off. And Jesus is like, nope, I'm just interested in one type of person. That's who I'm here for. So i got to ask us, how do we feel about truth? Like, how do you really feel about truth? How much do we actually like to hear the truth? about ourselves. I don't like truth. I really don't. You know, um, when our oldest daughter Taylor was going through some health problems when she was younger, we actually had to start looking into the ingredients of some things, you know, and, um, and I had to look at some ingredients of things that I would always be eating, you know? I mean, I don't know if you've ever looked at the ingredients of a Twinkie, but I don't think it's actually food. I'm just saying. I'm not sure if you've ever looked at the of the packet that makes these noodles taste really good, but I'm not sure if that's food either. One of my favorites that I feed to my babies is Cheetos, but again, there's nothing really in there that says food, but I love them, right? We heard you. And one of my favorite treats, you guys ever do the, oh, I could sit with a bag of chips and eat this entire thing. So good. So good. And you guys like sausage, summer sausage? I love sausage, salami. Salami is like almost in my blood. Jewish salami. Oh, every time I go over to my dad's, we cut up salami and we eat salami. Sausage, it's really good. You don't want to see it made. Right? So a lot of times, I don't even want to know how bad it is for me. Like, don't tell me. You're going to ruin it for me. 
Like, once you tell me, then I can't eat it with a clear conscience. So can you just not say anything? Don't say anything. Don't ruin it for me. Because I don't want to know what's in sausage. Because if you tell me, maybe I won't eat it. I don't want to know what's in hot dogs. Because a lot of times, uh, it's not really the best thing for you if you saw the ingredients all separated before they put it together in the big meat blender. You may not like hot dogs. Not sure what is makes a Twinkie work. I'm not sure. Don't tell me. I want to believe it's good for me. Like the oil, I want to believe that the oil is all natural and that it's actually good for me. I want, to, I want to believe that the little white chips after you cut this up is actually vitamins. And it's good for me. And I want to believe that the yellow dye number five in here is actually a superfood. I don't want to know. Don't tell me. It's going to mess it up. So keep quiet about it. Don't ruin it for me. You know, I could be that way with God. Like, I want to believe deep down inside that ah, the day of judgment, is he really going to separate the sheep and the goats? Like, am I, is he really that serious about continual living in sin? Like, in the come on, I mean, he's a loving God. He created this whole world. Like, am I to believe that he's actually going to send people to hell? Am I to believe that there's really that narrow of a path? Like, really, really? I mean, can I negate a lot of the hard scriptures with the good scriptures and just kind of hit a nice middle? Because I'm happy with my personal view of God. Don't ruin it for me. I don't want to know. Don't say anything because it's going to ruin it. You're going to mess it all up. How do I really feel about truth? How do I really feel about how God feels about me? How about the truth about my heart? Like if I were to really open up my heart and to see what's inside, how would God really feel about that, biblically speaking? The truth about how he feels about my life, my household, the things that I'm doing in secret and in darkness, my hobbies, my grades, right, my habits, my marriage, my kids, my future, my money, my purity, my you fill in the blank. How would he really feel about those things? Do you want to know? Do you really want to know, or do you like, don't tell me, you're going to ruin it for me? The truth about how God feels about how I think. Like These are things that no one else knows, but God knows how I think. Do I really want to know how he feels about how I think, how I feel, how I lust, how I'm jealous, my, angers and fits of rage, my anger and fits of rage when no one's looking, my greed, my fear my hate, my pride, my racism, whatever it might be. How do I really feel? My lying. How do I really feel about the truth? Do I want to hear it? Well, what if it's true? Like that red balloon. It's green! Why do I know it's green? Because someone told me it's green, and I want to believe that it's green, and it's green. But from over here, it's purple. You know, from over here, it's blue. Yep. You know, it's like my view of food. Most people have the same feelings about God. I don't feel like God would be so just. I don't feel that God would treat me that way. Not me. I got a special connection with God. He understands me. He gets me. I don't feel eating this is bad for me, so I will believe it's not bad for me. And I'll pretend that everything's fine. John 8, 31. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. 
See, the truth is actually designed to set us free. That's right. But that's scary. The truth is actually what's going to set me free. Not my feelings. Not what I believe. I would rather be my feelings and what I believe that sets me free than really the truth. Wouldn't you? James 2.19, here's a, Hollywood, a, a Halloween scripture for you. We're coming up to Halloween. Can I find James? There we go. 2.19. Now we'll start in 18. Someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So I'll ask you, is belief in God enough? Just believing, is that good enough? No, it, it's, it's not good enough because we find out even the demons believe. They may even believe better than us because they, they see God. We have to have faith in God. They're battling against the forces of good. So does it make it any better to be a believer? See, I'm not even going to be able to see the truth unless I'm holding to the teaching. You may not feel this. You may not like this. But it's true. Do you really love the truth? Is this what we're after? Remember the, um, a few good men? Some of you, maybe it's not in your generation, but it was definitely in my generation. Tom Cruise, Demi Moore, right? Jack Dixon. You can't handle the truth. He's like, you can't handle the truth. Maybe we can't handle the truth. What if the truth calls us to completely change our lives? What if the truth calls us to change our job? Or our music? Or our clothes? or our habits, or our future? <laughs> what if the truth, truth calls us to change our schedule and says, nope, this is, this is the schedule that you've got to now hold to? What if the truth calls us to change our attitude towards others? What if the truth calls us to get out of our comfort zone? Turn your Bibles over to 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9. And if you're looking for it in a paper Bible, it's the three T's in the New Testament. The Thessalonians is the first T. So we're going to go to the second book of Thessalonians. It's real easy to find because it's right after 1 Thessalonians. And we're looking at chapter 2 and verse 9. So, well, I'll explain it. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. In all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. So he's talking about actually the Antichrist, like towards the end there's going to be this entity that desires peace all over the world. And when he gives peace all over the world, people are going to reject the truth, and they're going to believe this, this peace, this false truth, this what feels good, what the world is preaching, what the world is telling us that we need. And God's like, if that's what you want, then you can have it. And actually, I'll help you out a little bit. I'll even give you a delusion if you want it so bad, to make you happy, bappy, all the way to the end. Re 
refuse to love the truth. It's like, I don't want to hear it. I don't want advice. I don't want to, I want to do what I want to do. So don't ruin it for me. I don't want to be open and confess sin. Why? Because it's, in, it's inconvenient and it's humiliating. So don't ruin it for me. Don't ask me the tough questions. I don't want to forgive and deal with my heart. Why? Because it justifies my actions. That bitter root there, I don't want to give it up. Why? Because it, it helps me to feel better about the situation or how my feelings are or whatever might come out in maybe a, a session with a professional. I don't want to forgive. I don't want to be like Jesus in every single way, just the ways that are convenient to me. We want to believe what we want to believe. Don't ruin it for me. But maybe you just can't handle the truth. We can't handle the truth. You know, um, basically what he's saying in the parable of the sower. If you can't handle the truth, I'm not here for you. And that's like, ow. It's just the truth. And I think what we're going to find is that most can't handle the truth. It is a narrow road. It's hard to find. It takes intention and work and faith, denial, killing the old life. But most don't want to know how the sausage is made. They just don't. Listen to some of these verses, some of the things that Jesus said. Small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. So if we, continue, if we start this journey and then we start looking back at the world, then we're not fit for it. He's like, I didn't come for you. Deny yourself and carry your cross. Kill your old life, right? Kill that old life dead and deny sin. So when it comes at us, we don't just dabble with it, mess with it. We run from it. We get away from it. We deny it. Say, no, I'm not dealing with you today. Is money getting in the way? Well, what does he say? Well, then sell everything you have and give it to the poor. If you don't forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Right. Well, that doesn't sound fair. It's the truth. That's all I have to say. It's just the truth. That's right. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the idolaters and all liars, they will be delivered to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Whoa, wait a second. Let's cut that scripture out. I don't want that one in there. Liars go, what? If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. The question is, who is more important than Jesus in our life? The right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Ah. Those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. What's in front of Jesus? It's just truth. It's sobering. It's just truth. Turn your Bibles to Galatians 6. In verse 7, it says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit it will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Wow. So if we live a life that's aimed at pleasing ourselves, we're not going to make it. If we live a life that's aimed at pleasing the Spirit, that's in line with God's Word, then we're going to reap eternal life. It's just the truth. Maybe you feel right now you can't handle anymore. 
you can't handle the truth. I think even going through these scriptures sometimes, I'm like, I don't want the truth. This is too much. Don't tell me about it. Don't look at my stuff. If you ever feel that way, don't even look at my stuff. I'm going to eat this when you guys aren't looking. We could be that way with ourselves. Don't look at that stuff. This is my church face. See my church face? It's all covered up. Looks great. But every time I do this, it's like, ah! You know, I was even embarrassed buying this stuff at Walmart when I was going through the line. I was thinking that that person's probably going to think, what are you doing to yourself? I've given up. Spiritually, we could be in the same exact spot. Don't look at me. Don't look. Just pretend it's not there. Let's cover it so that I can get back to that later. Don't bother me. Don't ruin it for me. Turn your Bibles over to Acts chapter 7. Oh, I'm going to talk about it, Tony. So Stephen just finishes the longest sermon in the New Testament, 53 verses, and he rocks it. He explains, he makes a connection between Old Testament, the coming of Jesus, and why uh, the people that were following the, the rules and regulations, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, were so blind to who Jesus is. And he gives this beautiful message, and look at verse 51. He says, you stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. They're not changed. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one of Jesus. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. So he's saying you are responsible for the death of Jesus. He's doing a Bible study with these guys, okay? You who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. Look at verse 54. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, all rushed at him, dragging him out of the city and began to stone him. Okay, so I'm going to do this for you. You're trying to tell the truth about me, and I'm going, la, 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 I don't want to hear it, la, 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 And I'm trying, like, hey, bro, you really need to, la, 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 I don't want to, la, 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 don't talk to me about this stuff. Don't look at, la, 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 it's still good for me, it's good for me, it's vitamins, it's vitamins. That's the scene. And not just one guy, like a whole group of guys, the whole Sanhedrin. Don't tell me, don't tell me, shut up, shut up, kill him. I want my Twinkies. And I start asking myself, am I the stiff neck? Am I hard to talk to? Am I hard to correct? Do people feel free to come up to me and correct me and help me? Or do I go with my emotions or the way that I act, my response to someone trying to dig into my heart, I go, don't tell me, I don't want to hear it. What am I willing to do to avoid truth? Am I ready to just kill somebody? Basically cut them off as a friend. Avoid them. Are we offended when someone challenges on challenges us on something that they see in our character? Do we get offended by that? Like, how dare you? Why would you approach me like that? I love the illustration. I heard it a long time ago. I don't remember who said it. But if you would you be upset with the fireman that pulled you out of the fire to save your life because he didn't do it properly? Why did you grab my arm that way? Did you know that you gave me a bruise? It's like, no, that wouldn't make any sense. So why are we get upset with each other when someone comes in and tries to pull us out of the burning building spiritually? 
How dare you? You didn't say it the right way. I'm not going to listen to you. I mean, imagine that scene. The fireman goes in to save you, and you're like, you're pulling me the wrong way. You're not saving me today. So like, yeah, but you're going to burn up. You're going to die. He's like, nope. You just did it wrong way. You came in all rude. You didn't even knock. You didn't respect me. You didn't treat me the way that I believe that you should treat me. I've been in the kingdom for 40 years. How dare you talk to me like that? I'm just a young Christian. How dare you talk to me like that? I'm a sister. How dare you talk to me like that? I'm a brother. Don't you believe? You know, we come up with stuff. We get upset, and someone's just trying to pull us out of a fire. And eventually, a fireman's going to go, peace be with you, because I'm not burning up with you. And that's what happens in here. So eventually, people go, all right, if that's what you want, I can't, I'm not burning up with you. Or are we grateful that someone would even have the courage and take the time to help our sorry behinds? For real. Like, someone stopped their life in midstream to stop and put themselves in a position of rejection to say something that they see in our character. It takes courage. It takes faith. It takes caring about how your future with God is more than they care about the friendship. And we go, la, 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 you know. But the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. We will get ourselves a group of friends that won't challenge us. It will look like we are in the kingdom. But no one's telling us what we really need to be hearing because we have pushed truth away. Truth is awkward. It's uncomfortable. It's never going to be easy. And it's never going to be nice to hear. We got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And sometimes it might seem unbearable. But maybe we can't handle it here. So I want to invite the truth seekers right now. So if you're not seeking the truth, Daydream. I'm giving you permission to daydream. If you don't want to enter into this valley, just kind of daydream. Roll with it. Maybe no one is going to actually know. It's all good. Shut it off. It's cool. This is only for people that are actually seeking the truth and that are ready to hear it. Are, are you with me? Okay. I'm warning you because it only gets better from here if you're seeking the truth. So go back over to Luke chapter 8. Biblical truth seekers, 8, and we're going to look in verse 15. It says, but the seed on good soil, the truth seekers, those who are seeking the truth, the good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Okay, so noble. Hmm. So really, actually, the word here for noble in the Greek is honest or good hearing. Someone who is sober, has sober judgment about what they're listening to. Okay, so they're honest with themselves when the truth comes in. Okay, and it's a lot like Acts 17, 11. We know the noble character, right? Noble character, sober, but also generated is the Greek term for that. Generated, meaning I'm a, it, it, there's movement, there's chasing after it, not just waiting for it to come, but you're after it, you're diligent, okay, motivated to hear the truth. So when the Bereans heard the truth, they didn't just sit there and go, oh, that really sounds cool. They go, I'm going to put it into practice to see if it works. They're generated, they were motivated, okay? So this is noble to God, 
those who desire the truth this way. Okay, so it's not just us sitting there going, oh, that's not truth. Truth, dog, truth. No, it's going, I heard it, now I'm going to do something with it. Now it's going to change me. It's going to make a difference in the way that I treat my spouse. It's going to make a difference the way that I uh, treat school. It's going to make a difference the way that I drive. It's going to make a difference the way that I fill in the blank. Do we love truth? Okay, now, truth seekers, turn the Bible over to 1 Corinthians 15. That's really easy to find because it's right before 2 Corinthians. <laughs> All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you're saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. If you're not a truth seeker, you've done all this. It's a waste of your time. Verse 3, for what I received, I passed on to you as first importance, that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. It's not something that we made up. It's according to the scriptures is what Paul's saying here. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. Go check this story out with them. That's what he's saying. Because they're alive, they're around, just go talk about it. You'll find somebody that Jesus was hanging with. At the same time, he was hanging on the other side of the city. And you could just check it all out. Confirm it. It's so cool. Most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep, Stephen. Verse 7, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. That's the truth. See, the gospel is our motivation. Do we believe it? Because that's the truth. See, it's not all bad news, right? It's not all what we have to change, what we have to give up. It's also what we gain. Because it's Jesus, it's the gospel. He's like, look, i got to remind you. And 1 Corinthians is a very rough letter. And by chapter 15, he's like, all right, I want to remind you of something. You didn't do this for nothing. You did this because of the message that I brought to you. Don't you remember? Guys, don't we remember? Don't we remember when we said Jesus was Lord? Don't we remember when we went under the waters of baptism and we came out for the first time feeling clean with a clear conscience? Don't you remember? That's what he's saying. Don't you remember? You're not doing this just to get a better life. You're doing this because you gave up your life. And you gain everything. Don't you remember? That's why we gave it all up. Look at John 3.16. And I'll get to my first point soon. Don't worry. Saturday night service. You'll never come again. Just kidding. I don't even know what my point is. Truth. All right. Point number one, truth. Point number two, truth. Point number three, truth. All right. And here we go. Point number four, truth. Verse 16. We all know this scripture, but we're going to read on, and you're going to be like, oh, I didn't know that was in there. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Love, truth, or ain't got no time for you. Jesus was always, this, is, this was his ministry. This is the verdict. Verse 19. Light has come into the world, but people love the darkness. 
right? Whoop, don't look at my stuff. People love the darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. They don't want to know what the ingredients are. Don't tell me. Verse 20, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives the truth, lives by the truth, comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This is not a lesson on salvation, but a lesson on what leads to salvation. See, I think a lot of times we think, that's the end, John 3, 16. No, it's the beginning. It's the beginning of a relationship with God is to love the truth and to love the light. And it's like, Jesus is like, if you could do that, you're going to make it. If you could just do that, you are going to make it. So it's a lesson on truth, really. Living a life of truth. So do we love the truth? Quietly. Because I think we really are contemplating that. Do I really love truth? What is that going to mean for me? What is that going to mean for my life if I really fall in love with truth. So how are we feeling about God today? Is he who we want to be with? Is he who we're here for? Are we in love with him? Are we in love with truth? Are we those with good soil? Humble, teachable, correctable, open, in love with truth. Even if it's something we don't want to hear even if it runs, runs our lives, changes the direction at which we're traveling, will we still love the truth? Even if it ruins your favorite snacks. Amen. True. Let's go ahead and uh, we're going to say a prayer for communion. Father in heaven, I thank you so much just for this time uh, that we've had together tonight. Um, and I'm grateful that uh, it's not just in this room here, but uh, those who are streaming right now that are, uh, are joining us. Father, I'm just grateful that we're able to look into your word and as hard as it is to hear, uh, we all can say a resounding this together right now, it's just true. And it's what you expect of us. God, I pray that we can be truth seekers. And if there's something in the way of that right now, that we will take a good look at it and really make decisions to deal with it. We don't want anything separating us from you, God. And Father, we are so grateful that Jesus did not just come to this earth, die for our sins, and fly away like Superman. But he showed us how to do it. Showed us what was important. And God, I pray that right now, even as we take communion together, and even as we, as we leave here tonight, um, we will ponder these things, God. We will, we will come to such a place of gratitude uh, that it points us in the direction at which we need to go. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for this time. Please bless this communion as we take it. We pray these things in Jesus' name.